everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. And you're watching In Depth on Now You Know. We're brought to you by abetterrootplanner.com. Use our link in the show notes below to get a 30-day free trial. And we're sponsored by bigbattery.com with the best battery prices in the USA guaranteed. If you've got something you need to power from homes to cars, RVs to boats, and much more, bigbattery.com has you covered, offering the newest battery tech. Use the code now you know to save 5% off your purchase today at bigbattery.com. And this week's episode is sponsored by Blinkist. Do you have some challenges or goals you've set for yourself this year? Yeah, maybe you want to learn something new or get motivated. We just listened to a blink of Willpower Doesn't Work by Benjamin Hardy. Now, you can think of a blink as a condensed book. It's short, so you can either read it or listen to one in less than 15 minutes. To be honest, I just wouldn't have had the time or inclination to pick up Willpower Doesn't Work. Yeah, I mean, it sounds good, but we're just so busy. But with Blinkist, we get to listen to it podcast style together. It's great for car rides or walks or just when we both need a break. You have access to over 3,000 titles even when you're offline. And Blinkist offers full-length audiobooks. Premium subscribers get special member pricing up to 65% off the regular retail price. And Blinkist now offers shortcasts. Yeah, Blinkist teamed up with popular podcast creators to blink those for you too so you can get to the heart of a podcast episode fast. And Blinkist has 14 million active users. And I can see why. Blinkist isn't here to replace books or podcasts. The way I look at it, Blinkist enhances them and actually exposes me to more of them. The first 100 people to use our link are going to get unlimited access for one week to try out Blinkist. You'll also get 25% off if you want to try the full membership. And the seven-day trial is completely free. You can cancel at any time during that period. On today's episode of In-Depth, we wanted to dive a little deeper into an exciting new company that we told you about recently on Tesla Time News. The company is Monarch Tractor, and they are making this, an all-electric farm tractor. Now, an electric tractor is something that, honestly, I thought we'd see sooner, like five years ago or something. Because, I mean, unlike a car where you're trying to keep the weight as light as possible, a farm tractor needs to be heavy anyway to do most of its job. So a big battery pack isn't really a problem. Yeah, and you don't have range anxiety. You're on a farm. You're not driving hundreds of miles away from your home every day. And judging by the number of emails we get from farmers, there seems to be a demand for electric tractor. And before you start commenting, yes, we know about other companies like Solatrack and FarmTrack, which are other electric tractor companies. But Monarch Tractor is adding a cool feature to their tractors, which I think is a game changer. Autonomy. Now, we got a chance to interview Monarch's president and co-founder, Mark Schwager who used to work at Tesla, by the way. CEO and co-founder Praveen Penmetza. And Monarch's chief farm officer, Carlo Mondavi. But I think the first question you're probably asking is, why do we need electric tractors anyway? What we do know is that farm vehicles, farm equipment, um, produce 1% of the world's uh, carbon dioxide emissions. So, I mean, I know what you might be thinking, like 1%, that's so small, but it's 1% of a huge problem and... Honestly, if you can tackle 1% of a huge problem, that's great, in my opinion. Yeah. And let's remember that today's tractors run on diesel fuel, right? And so if you want to get rid of fossil fuels, you're going to need to solve this problem. You're going to have to go electric even on the farm. But I have a question. There aren't any EVgo, Electrify America, or even Tesla superchargers on farms. So how do farmers charge these electric tractors? What we find is that farmers typically use compact tractors 100 days per year. So without investing in stationary storage, um, there are days where you could use a solar roof and charge the tractor entirely. Uh, That is possible. I think in order to deal with any sort of uh, variation in in how the weather uh, chooses to to reveal itself, investing in stationary storage is probably the better way to go uh, in, in addition to the solar system. But we definitely see that as possible. Our company, though, we are focused on the tractor first. Um, we will be working with partners on on solar and stationary storage deployments. But we see that as the future. And actually, one step beyond that is is really where we see the future because essentially land uh, can perform double duty, meaning that you can grow crops in the ground and then you can have solar panels above them, especially in vineyards where you can 
you know, combined usage of the stanchions that actually hold um, the, the, the vines in place. With a little bit extra height, uh, they can become a base for, for panels. And agrivoltaics is just in its infancy uh, right now. Uh, but that's really, you know, 20 years down the line where we see the world. Now, what I love about Mark's answer there is that Monarch is envisioning the farm of the future. I think so many companies today try to just answer a consumer's need right now. Like, what do you need right now? Okay, we'll make that for you. Without thinking about how the life of the consumer could be better in the future. And what Mark brought up in his answer here, and I think it's easy to miss, is agrivoltaics. Right now, agrivoltaics is in its infancy. It's being tested on university test farms mm -hmm. um, and labs, but the results are very promising. Now, you might think it's crazy to shade a plant that you want to grow, but plants only need a certain amount of sunlight. Past this point, called the light saturation point, the plant can't do any more photosynthesis. Rather, it just needs water to sweat to keep from cooking itself in the hot sun. And solar panels can reduce the evapotranspiration, the sweating that the plant has to do, um, and it increases water use efficiency. That's really interesting. I mean, because there's a lot of places where we're kind of used to seeing crops grow, and yet they're really sunny all the time. So that water that you're watering your fields with just gets evaporated right back off your field. With solar panels, you're keeping a lot of that moisture where you need it, in the plant. Now, you might be saying like, who cares? 85% of the world's water use is agriculture. So any little tweak that you could do, um, you know, by installing agrivoltaics on even a small portion of farmland um, would have a huge impact on water. And it would also be generating electricity, which could not only be used to charge the tractor, but it could be used to charge the world. If you wanna learn more about agrivoltaics, uh, Oregon State University actually has a really good video on it. It only got like 200 views, but I'll put a link in the description down below so you can watch it. Really informative, gets everyone up to speed. I think it was really cool. And so what we're essentially talking about here would be a self-powered farm. And I think if we just marketed this properly, you could probably get every farmer and every citizen in every country on board. So what are you talking about? What, what are we thinking? I'm talking about Freedom Farms. You tired of relying on foreign countries for your farm's diesel fuel? You tired of paying high prices to power all your farm equipment? You tired of having to wear out your body riding on a noisy, dirty tractor all day? Then you need Freedom Farms. Your farm, powered by the sun and autonomous robot tractors that work for you cleanly, quietly, all day, all night, and they don't talk back when you tell them to do something. Freedom, Freedom Farms. Farms, America, woo! <laughs> and it would work in any country. It would work in, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Any country, because let's face it, most countries on earth that have farmland have sun hitting the farmland. Otherwise, it's not. Yeah, otherwise, you don't have a farm. Yeah, exactly. Maybe a mushroom farmer. Maybe. Uh, but yeah, I mean, most of the world's farmland is bathed in sun all day. And uh, as we've learned, a lot of that sun is being used to just kind of evaporate water off the plants which yeah. you don't really need to do. Okay, so we've mentioned a couple times that Monarch tractors work autonomously, but what does that actually mean? Well, we asked them about how autonomy works with the Monarch tractor. So we see the autonomy as an operational autonomy. So we look at certain operations and we look and say, how can we automate spraying? How can we automate mowing? So our approach to autonomy is very different compared to what we call an urban mobility autonomy challenge. However, we do have very different challenges out in the field. So the number of unidentified objects that we can come across in the field is different. There's a lot of them that are not classified uh, with public data sets, so we have to do a lot of that work. The environment also is a lot more challenging. Uh, so for example, uh, we are out, uh, the, we have to sometimes go through the trees, right? This is not a problem that your uh, autonomous car has to deal with. It doesn't have to deal with, do I go through the leaves and the brush, right? Those are things that we go through. Uh, for example, very often we also have to train our tractor to go through tall grass. It's very hard to determine what's inside that grass. So that's not a common problem that autonomous cars have to face, but it's a problem that uh, our uh, technical AI engineers and our autonomy engineers have worked on for a long time to, to kind of solve. So very different problems. But from a risk standpoint, absolutely right. It's a very different uh, uh, risk factor. It's a much more controlled environment. And in the worst case, we can bring the tractor to a stop and send an alert back to the farmer. It's so funny. I really thought that it was going to be easier 
to have an autonomous tractor uh, than to have a car on roads because it's going so much slower um, mm -hmm. that, you know, who cares? It, all you have to do is stop. I mean, in, in some ways it does seem easier because, again, you just bring the thing to a stop and it's not like you're holding up traffic. Well, that's you're just a, on the phone. That's a really good point. You can't stop a car on the highway when the rest of the cars aren't stopped because <laughs> you'll create a pileup. Yeah. But on a farm, yeah, if the tractor is going two miles an hour and it doesn't know what to do, it just stops and nothing bad happens. Right. It just sends an alert to the farmer and the farmer can come out and be like, oh, that dang goat or whatever. Right. So, I mean, in that sense, they have a much easier time of safely stopping anything that goes awry. Right, because, I mean, most of their code can just say, when in doubt, stop. Right. Whereas, I'm being honest here, a Tesla, when in doubt, can't always stop. <laughs> right. But as Praveen said, it has to handle a lot of situations that most cars don't have to, like driving through tall grass. Right. So that's really interesting that the learnings, you know, from the on-road you know, autonomous driving don't necessarily uh, correlate directly to farm tractors. Yeah, I mean, their autonomous team has to actually work on a data set that isn't really publicly available, as you mentioned. There's not a data set of foxes jumping out of grass. Mm. But I want to talk about how Monarch uses their tractors as data collection centers. Are farmers going to even know what this is? Uh, there's a there's a mis uh, uh, misconception, right, that farmers are not tech savvy or uh, you know, they, are, they don't want to implement technology. That's not what's happening there. What tech, uh, farmers want is technology that makes a difference in terms of dollars and cents. And technology from that standpoint has failed them so far. So when they don't see the dollars and cents, they're not going to invest into it. So from that standpoint, farmers are looking at uh, using a lot of uh, drone data that they already do these days. They have been big adopters in the drone industry. They have also used a lot of satellite imagery. Both of these have given them lots of data. So they're getting used to working with data and things like moisture sensors and things. But the challenge has been that all of this uh, data has been distributed. With our tractor, and since the tractor is used for all operations on the farm, it allows us to kind of bring all of that data together in a contextual manner and we provide the most valuable data for them, which is you know weather data, coupled to the vision data. So it's almost like the vision that you painted of them walking down the, the row and looking at each and every one of their, their, you know, their plants, right? That is now possible with our tractor virtually. So they can click on any plant on their field and get a picture of the last operation that happened on it and what it looks like today, what it looked like weeks ago, months ago, etc. Wow. So, I mean, I think I'm understanding this better. A farmer needs to know about, well, in a perfect world, every plant, every head of livestock on their farm. And with a mobile autonomous camera weather station computer roaming around the farm day and night, the farmer can know way more about the status of everything on their farm. Yeah. And here's another point that I didn't really grasp until we started talking about it, which is I thought it was like one farmer, one tractor. But if you have a big farm, hundreds of acres, you could have one farmer and three or four or five or more tractors that they're controlling. Because yeah. basically you're like, hey, tractor number one, go over there and do some watering. Tractor number two, go do some spraying. You know, And you can just send them out and then check on them with an app as you need to. It's interesting because this like a, a automation um, you know, is going to take people's jobs. But I think one thing to remember is that like tractors in general took – uh, you know, right. farmers' jobs and have in some ways enabled us to live in the modern society that we exist in. Because, you know, when everyone had to work on the farm all day, not a lot of people could be YouTubers, you know? Right. So if you're getting kind of excited at this point, uh, then you must be a farmer, but also you probably want to know some stats like the prices and et cetera. So let's hear from Mark and learn some more about it. From a stature standpoint, it's a very, very narrow, narrow tractor. So our overall width is just 1.1 meters, which allows it to fit in just about any farming um, ecosystem that it could possibly be used. The battery size we don't really go into. Um, it's a massive battery, I would say, uh, bigger than anything you would find in a roadworthy electric car today. Um, but um, we don't think about it in terms of range. Um, mileage is not, not our target. Hours of operation is our target. Um, so the specs that we need um, from a discharge standpoint are elevated but continuous. So you can think about battery discharge in the point 0.1 to point 0.2C 
um, sort of um, operating range of where we need to be all the time. Unlike a car, uh, which you're constantly peaking out at 10C when you have to accelerate uh, and things like that. So we have a completely different dynamic on how our battery needs to be used. Um, some of the other specs that I think are interesting is that um, you know, we have built our tractor around the infrastructure that farmers have available. Um, and that means level two charging uh, rather than DC fast charging. I don't know too many farms that have that level of power uh, just available for uh, um, their existing operations that they have today. And one of the great things that we've done as, as a company is we've fit our product into the existing ecosystem. Uh, that 220 volt plug that they have in their barns, that's usually used for welding and that's perfect for level two charging. Um, one other quick thing is that you think about a big battery and level 2 charging, it must take a long time to charge. It takes about four or five hours. But um, for farmers, you can't say, hey, you have four to five hours of downtime. So our battery is actually swappable, which uh, allows farmers to change a battery in 10 minutes with one person in the middle of the field. Um, it doesn't need to be perfectly flat or anything. And so you can imagine how much a massive battery weighs. Um, and so this is just a feat of, uh, of incredible engineering that our, our team has come up with in order to um, focus on the farmer's use case that allows them to operate continuously. Okay, I, wow, I didn't realize how narrow this tractor is. I mean, 1.1 meters, that's really narrow. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we'd fit. You right. Know, that's like, like this, this wide. Right. And that means you can probably redo your farm to have even narrower crops if you needed to. Yeah, I, I think that that's one interesting aspect to it. The other one is the, the 10 hours of continuous operation. I don't think a lot of people might have been expecting that for an electric tractor that you were thinking that maybe, oh, we'd have to go back and charge for another eight hours. Also, this 10 minute battery change in the field, Yeah. Um, really interesting to me because I mean, we talked to a company, Spark Charge, mm -hmm. um, where basically you could bring a battery out and charge your car, but you had to make sure that the, the ground was flat and level. And, and they said basically there that it doesn't matter what the ground conditions are. You can just change this enormous sounding battery pack. Right. I think you'd want to do it in the barn, to be honest, because I think you'd want to be charging that one up while you're driving off to do the rest of your work. Well, in a perfect world. But yeah, I mean, yeah, like if, if there was something that went wrong. Right. It's nice to know that you don't have to like, what, get a tow truck in between your, you know, peach trees or something right. that would not go over well. Now, here's another feature that I didn't really think about before, which is the power outlet. Um, being able to bring that out in the field and have power wherever you go so that you can weld your fence and fix things is huge. Yeah, and also we have this full interview that you can go watch over on Disruptive Investing uh, where we talk about how that outlet could be used to power implements um, way more efficiently than tractors usually do. But I'm sure a big question you're thinking right now, especially if you are a farmer, is what's the price? Because you can get a diesel tractor for a few thousand dollars less than the $50,000 starting price of the Monarch. So one of the big exciting things is, is um, you know, the cost is actually really, really reasonable. And it's kind of in the middle too. Um, the tractors that I personally run on my ranch right now cost like $70,000. So we're $20,000 less than those. And then there's the, the diesels that are about $30,000 that come in kind of at the base level. Um, Monarch offers so much more in terms of being able to capture data, being electric. You know, the, the savings on being electric is immense. Um, it's it's uh, you know something like forty five dollars per day, and when you when you add that up uh, times the the days that the tractors needed and the amount of tractors that are needed for a farm, the savings just jump. And that's just being electric. And uh, Zach, uh, you know, on the electric car world, we are used to like looking at our commutes on a daily basis, looking at how much, uh, you know, fuel we save and how much of dollars that is, right? We're used to running that calculator. We do the same thing for farmers, is we, we look at their operations and say, which operations are you running? How much are you running those? And what's happening these days is due to the growth of organic food sales, uh, which requires farmers to use less chemicals, they have to do more mechanical operations. So the usage of the tractor is actually increasing. You cannot spray something and kill it, you'll have to run a tractor to, um, you know, to either cultivate it or, or mow it, right? So you're running more hours on the tractor. So we run a calculator for them, which is available on our website, where farmers can select the number of uh, drivers they have, the number of tractors they wanna buy, how many hours they use a tractor, and see the dollars and cents in terms of savings 
and it's immense. It's even more compelling, Zach, uh, from an uh, electric car standpoint, right? We're used to seeing four or five, seven years, depending on your commutes for electric cars. With our farmers and the way our tractor is designed, we are looking, we are looking at like 18 months to three years for complete payback of the tractor cost without any subsidy which is just like amazing value for farmers who are trying to save everywhere they can these days. So 70 horsepower is more power and torque than other tractors of this class. Yeah, it's interesting how they basically give you more power at less price. Um, and so it does seem like a pretty good value option. Um, and the other thing is the cost savings because it can reduce labor. So if Praveen is right, then a payback period of say 18 months to three years to pay back the cost of the tractor is huge because it's going to continue paying back after that point, which right. means that's just money in your pocket. Yeah. So, I mean, that's really great. And also they're electric, which again goes straight into the payback period. So there's a lot less to break down and maintain. I mean, every farmer that I know has to also be kind of a hydraulics and engine expert, where they're basically out in the field replacing hydraulic parts and fixing hydraulics all the time. What's cool about electric is that even though there are some hydraulic stuff for the attachments, for the most part, it's the electric motor doing the work and not the hydraulics. Yeah, and as we talk about in our interview, uh, basically you just never had this much electrical power available to you as a farmer. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to basically take the power plant of the vehicle, which is an engine, and either convert it into something that spins or something that's hydraulic pressure and work everything else off of that. But that's not ideal because it's really easy to run wires, much harder to run hydraulic tubing True. or have a spinning thing that you need to connect to. Yeah. All right, so this sounds really good, but I think we all might be thinking the same thing. When will these actually be available? Um, our first deliveries will be this year. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna build um, a production capacity within our facility here in Livermore uh, that has the capability of doing about 20 a week. Um, and we're going to start delivering those to customers towards the end of this year. And then the next obvious question is, will these be available everywhere? Yeah, for, for the beginning, we're, we're going to stick here in, uh, in California and Oregon um, and uh, possibly uh, up into Washington as well. Um, we recognize that a, a product um, needs to have great service uh, when, it's, uh, when it's a new product with a lot of new technologies that we're putting um, into a new platform. Um, so we, uh, our most important thing is provide a high quality product and if anything goes wrong, um, then we're going to be there to take care of it. Um, we, we recognize that farmers have mission critical operations. Uh, we will not leave them hang. We will be there to, to help them with their product, whether it's virtually uh, through, the, through the screen on the, on, on the actual product or within just a couple of hours uh, from a service, on-site service perspective. Um, to do that, we can't you know, sell one tractor in, in Germany and one tractor in the Netherlands. Um, we, have to, we have to expand into a region deliberately. Uh, but that isn't to say we aren't um, saying, hey, Europe, we're, we're coming for you as well. Um, just give us some time and we'll make sure that we can provide the same level of quality and the same level of service uh, in just a, a couple quarters afterwards. Yeah. Also, Zach, like along those lines, uh, strategically, our product development right from day one, we have prioritized uh, components, subsystems that have already been validated. So a lot of our tractor uh, commodity components, right, like uh, the axles and the gearbox and uh, even the electric motor, et cetera, are all been leveraged from existing automotive supply chains or the ag equipment supply chains. And then on top of that, we have added our custom componentry and our custom technologies. But the fact that we have that in place, number one, Number two is we have a lot of existing ag equipment companies supporting us, both as investors and also in our production. Um, you know, combined means that we can scale faster. We are not trying to build everything under one roof. We are trying to leverage the ecosystem, but we are managing the final mic uh, assembly in a micro factory kind of a model that Mark is talking about. So what that means is people who are placing orders around the world can expect to see deliveries much sooner. They don't need to wait for us to build a gigafactory. It's easier for us to deploy micro factories and also our partners, our existing companies with distribution channels that we are currently working on leveraging. So that allows us to reach all these people very quickly. 
I, I do want to pay some homage to uh, my former employer because the reason that these these components are available and the reason that the ecosystem has come around for all of these electric vehicle components is because Tesla pioneered them 10 years ago. If Tesla didn't do what Tesla did, uh, the entire automotive tier one ecosystem would not be available for us to leverage. Um, Thankfully, because Tesla uh, vertically integrated everything under the sun, uh, we don't have to. Uh, so uh, we're, we're thankful that we can take, take advantage of the ecosystem that exists today. Well, that sounds great. But will these actually be able to scale up and will the company be able to deliver them? I mean, as Elon said, it's one thing to make a prototype. It's another to scale up to mass production. So I think the most important thing that I've learned from, from working at Tesla is that we cannot compromise on the product, meaning that our goal is not to make the best electric tractor, it's not to make the best autonomous tractor, it's to make the best tractor full stop. And that was our goal at Tesla, make the best car. The other thing is don't be afraid to try something and fail. At Tesla we tried a lot of different things. Um, not all of them were successful, but the successes are really successful. And I think again, Monarch has a great vision for the future. We don't see farming as a profession that people want to get out of, because that's what is happening all over the world today. We want it to be a profession that everybody runs towards. And we've seen this in automotive. I was in the automotive industry in the mid 2005-2010 uh, timeframe, when if you told somebody you were joining the automotive industry, you know, they would, they would uh, question your career path, right? They would say, <laughs> but we see that point in agriculture today. And we want to play an active role in making food more sustainable, making farming more profitable, and bringing it, scaling it at a global level and really touching each and every farmer around the world. So this is a company I'm really excited about. I think it was smart to go into stealth mode so that they worked out a lot of these problems with real farmers to get them on the farms and see what they needed, then come out with a real product so that it's actually, it's not just a CGI, it looks, you know, it's actually driving down the fields, it actually has autonomy. I am still a little skeptical of all companies when they say that they can scale up because now they've gone from lab for years to now going, oh, we have to make this. But they do seem to have a good plan and they have a lot of backing and experience in the automotive industry and it's great that Mark worked for Tesla so he knows how to scale things up. And I think it's kind of smart for them to be focusing on like the California vineyard market. It's definitely like a higher margin <laughs> style of farm. Mm -hmm. um, so this is more like the Model S of tractors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the future, they might even, you know, make the Model 3 or at least increase production to, you know, give it to the average farmer in America who isn't, you know, on some vineyard. But I think that the really exciting part to me is that it's going to change the way that farmers see their farms. And it's exactly the same as when you get in a Tesla and it's your Tesla for the first time. You start to see your life in a different way. You start to understand how much energy you're using because it's something that can be tracked mm -hmm. as opposed to going to the gas pump. Because when you go to the gas pump, it's like, oh man, that was so expensive. And then you <laughs> throw the receipt away. When you switch to electric, you know how many kilowatt hours you're using um, and you actually have the ability to generate that power yourself. I mean, a farmer can't pump oil out of the ground, refine it on his property and then use it in his tractor on the farm. But a farmer is used to taking a seed and growing it into a plant. And here it's a similar analogy there. They can now take the sun with their solar panels and take that power and power their whole farm with it. I think they're ready for that transformation. It's just they've never had the tools before to do it. And this would be another revenue stream for them. So I think that agrivoltaics and, you know, the Monarch electric tractor mesh really, really well together. And I just want to come back to this point. You know, even if you're not a farmer, take a look at this chart. This is the United States broken up into land use. So these aren't the locations where <laughs> the, you know, the farms are. Um, but you can see the vast majority of the United States is farmland. And the amount of area that we would need to cover in solar panels to provide enough electricity for the entire country is this tiny blue square. Wow. So give you some idea for people who are like, well, it's just, you can't fit the solar anywhere. There's not enough room and how it... No, because there is plenty of room. And with agrivoltaics, and this just fits so nicely into that little uh, niche, we'd be able to knock off 1% of all emissions, global CO2 emissions. And on top of that, probably generate 
enough electricity for the entire world. And I know a lot of you are going to quickly comment, if we covered all our farms with solar, there wouldn't be enough space for... <laughs> no, you don't have to take your entire farm and cover it with solar right. panels. A small fraction of your farm would be plenty of power to power your farm. Uh, and most of your crops like corn and wheat probably need the sun all day long. So it's only certain crops that need to have panels that would be over them. But I, I do want to go back to the agrivoltaics for a second. And these aren't going to be dumb panels. These are going to be panels that are powered. And so they're going to be tracking the sun. And so you can imagine if you had a crop that, let's say, really enjoyed morning sun, the panels could move themselves out of the way, not collect much sunlight, let the plants get the sunlight in the morning. And then at noon, when the sun is baking down, it would have just fried those plants. The solar panels move back into position. They shade the plants. The plants are happy. The solar is getting power. Like that to me is going to be the farm of the future. Definitely. And I don't think that the farmers would embrace agrivoltaics if they didn't have something to plug into it. True. I really do think that, you know, just like when people get their Tesla and then they're like, I want to get solar on my roof because then it's even cheaper to drive my car. As soon as these farmers get their tractors and they say, I have a lot of land. And in fact, some of this land isn't even farm. It's not anything. I could I could put a solar system right there. I could charge up my tractor. I could I could power my whole house, my whole operation completely by the sun. And it's going to be cost effective for me. This is the little seed that needs to get planted in farmers' heads that's going to make a big difference. And like we talked about in our full interview, which you can check out on the Disruptive Investing channel, it's 45 minutes of great information. Uh, but we talked about how butts and seats with Tesla is what we talk about all the time on our channel. And to bring that back to farmers, I think we need a different phrase, maybe butts in barns <laughs> or, or boots on the desk. Like, because if these tractors are going to be autonomous... Farmer can kick back, relax. Yeah, I mean, think about the endless hours you have to sit in the tractor if you're the farmer or the farmhand uh, doing a very repetitive, sometimes dangerous task. Also breathing in fumes from whatever you're spraying on the fields. Now that's all being done by a robot. And never before in history have we had the opportunity to do this. This has only been in science fiction movies. Mm -hmm. Now, looks like it's becoming a reality. It's really exciting. And if you want to see these interviews a few days early, you can sign up on the Now You Know Investor Club over on patreon.com slash now you know. You'll also get access to our Investor Club Slack with over 1,400 members of viewers of this channel who have joined and over 100 different channels to discuss different topics from mining to EV companies to investment tools. Yeah, because let's not forget, Monarch Tractor might be going public someday. Thank you so much for watching In Depth. We'll see you next Friday. Now, now you, you know. know.